Welcome to Growing Up in Easton. My name is Priscilla Almquist Olson. I'm your host today, May 28, 2016. And it gives me a great pleasure to have an Eastonite and civic-minded uh, citizen, Leon Lombardi, as my guest. So welcome, Leon. Thank you, Priscilla. Great to be here. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about uh, your earliest years and, uh, and so forth. I mean, you have a, a, an extraordinary history, a family history. So let's start out there. Well, uh, my parents moved to Easton in 1945. Um, they purchased um, the property, my, my dad did, at an auction. Um, World War II was coming to an end and uh, the owners of the property at that time, uh, what, it was a company in New York. And the uh, story that has been you know, said over and over again is that the owner of the company wanted to own a farm to give his son an agricultural deferment during World War II. So as the war was coming to an end, um, it was placed on the market. And uh, at the auction, my father was the high bidder but didn't have the money for the down payment. So he had to run back to uh, Rhode Island uh, where he lived and a lot of the family and got the down payment, uh, the deposit from uh, a brother-in-law, but then got lost on the way back. This is well before the <laughs> days of interstate highways and all. Uh -huh. and he had only been to Easton one time. But you know, the end of the story is that he got there on time and was able to put down the deposit and uh, became the owner of uh, what was then called Maplewood Farm. And, um, and if I can just take a couple of minutes, um, you know, to say that there was an interesting history about that farm. Uh, back in the late 1800s to into the early 1900s, it was owned by James Rankin, who had a dry land duck farm on the property. And he would uh, not only sell the ducks locally, but ship duck, live ducks and duck eggs around the country. And uh, he was really renowned uh, for that, his um, uh, very successful duck operation. In fact, he even developed um, a form of an incubator that was made right in Easton. And he got a patent, and I've turned that patent over to the um, Historical Society. Uh, so after the property was sold around 1908, um, it changed hands a couple of times. And then Frederick Lothrop Ames purchased it. Uh, and that was in 1914. And he used that property for um, the home of his uh, Clydesdales and Fairhome Footprint, which was, became a world famous Clydesdale, uh, lived there and on the property. And then when F.L. Ames died in 1923, his widow um, sold the property and uh, sold it to Produces Dairy, which I'm sure a lot of the people here in sure. Easton remember Produces Dairy. And they had the property until 1934. So then, my again, my dad um, bought in 1945. Well, then what an interesting history. Uh, now, I've read about Rankin because he revolutionized uh, the poultry business <coughs> by inventing the incubator. Right. And that's right here from Easton. So take notice, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we are famous for many, many things here uh, and many renowned people. And the fact that Frederick Lothrop Ames, who lived uh, in, um, which, which is now Stonehill. Correct. Um, purchased that property, uh, and I have seen pictures of the Clydesdale horses. Uh, you know, maybe uh, some people out there don't know about that, but that's quite, quite an uh, interesting uh, bit of history, also. I know because it seems like every generation <coughs> of the Ameses had some pretty unique interests. I mean, we always think about them with the shovel uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. and the railroad, but then later generations. You know, were uh, had other diverse interests, and uh, of course, I think uh, Frederick Lothrop, him, uh, the father, um, was involved with the Guernsey cattle, and right. then that same interest passed down to the son, F. L. Ames, uh, and uh, he also, though, had the Clydesdales. So, mm -hmm. and and in both of those instances, the Guernseys as well as the Clydesdales, um, they were nationally, internationally renowned. They were um, supposedly um, looked to for strengthening the, uh, the breeds, um, both right. cattle and Clydesdales. Well, I remember the Guernsey cow auctions mm. as a child uh, because my great aunt's daughter, Hazel, married Joe Nagel, who was the head uh, Guernsey cow guy on right. the farm. 
and they <clears throat> lived in the house on the property. And, um, uh, and he, I can remember that he was the only one that could deliver the calves. Uh, and there are pictures that the Historical Society has with Joan Nagel. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the Historical Society has a, a <clears throat> lot of material on that, um, as well as um, Buddy Worcester's CD that he prepared called Return to uh, Langwater, which is a wonderful hour-long CD talking about the whole history of the Ameses and their involvement with the, um, the Guernsey cattle and um, the, um, the Clyde Seals. In fact, um, one part of that video shows an aerial view of um, you know, what was um, Maplewood Farm, both when the uh, Ameses had it as well as um, my dad. So Now, did, um, did ECAT produce that uh, DVD with uh, Buddy Worcester? I don't think so. Um, uh -huh. I think um, Buddy did that um, <coughs> on his own with another individual. Um, well, maybe ECAT can post it on, in their library mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. it can be shared with other people yeah. here right. in town. And so the thing <laughs> is, um, so my, again, my dad ran a dairy farm. Um, in fact, his milk was sold to uh, Producers Dairy. Um, and um, I came along in 1949, and of course, uh, I'd like to say that although I was born at Brockton Hospital in Brockton, whenever I have to fill out a form, where were you born? I'm always troubled, but you know, shall I be honest and say it was in Brockton or uh, in Easton? But as I say, I, got, I came back to Easton as soon as I could, uh, <laughs> as soon as I came out of the hospital with my mother. Well, I was born in Brockton Hospital too. I mean, we mm -hmm. all were. I think from Easton at that time. Right. I mean, earlier years, I mean, earlier generations, it would have been right in Easton, but um, when right. hospitals came along, then obviously our mothers went other places. Right. Yeah. My mother was born on Jenny Lynn Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's so true. Uh, I can remember the, uh, going to an auction where a Guernsey bull sold for $18,000. It's when, and my dad, I think, was making uh, 3500 a year. So this was a very impressive amount. Right. And uh, so these were very prized cows uh, internationally. So, you know, living on Purchase Street, as I did at Maplewood Farm, um, it was a very rural part of town. I mean, I grew up in, in true southeastern. I mean, it was the southeastern corner of the state. The Hockamock Swamp was on one side of the farm, and Cranberry Bogs um, it was the Morse Brother Cranberry Bogs. Uh, which you know are go from um, bordering our property out to uh, Foundry Street, uh, and uh, there weren't a lot of kids growing up in that neighborhood when I was there. So um, I was just a farm kid. You know, uh, when I went to local schools, um, actually the farm became a, a destination spot for some cl uh, class outings. You know, like a field day or whatever. A couple times uh, we had picnics um, uh, on the front lawn of our house because that was where the class trip took place to go see um, the farm, the working farm. And what uh, school did you go attend? The very first school, uh, other than a nursery school in, in Northeastern, but I went to kindergarten at Center School and then first and second grades at the Southeastern School um, right there, Washington Street and Central Street coming together. Um, and it's now that office building. Um, on 138. Third and fourth grades were at the Eastendale School and fifth grade back to Center School for one year. And then I went up to Northeastern for sixth grade. And that's when you start to really get to know other um, youngsters of your age uh, growing up in Easton. The only other contact I would have really had with um, kids from other part of town was uh, on Sundays, you know, coming up to Northeastern for church and then uh, Sunday school catechism classes. And so you definitely got to meet some kids, but um, you know, then I went back into the rural section for those first few years. Yeah. So um, when you were, uh, you know, before you, you came to sixth grade, so say in your early formative years, mm -hmm. um, what a great place to, for outdoor activities. Oh yeah, I had a pony. Um, and um, you know, the farm was always, um, an interesting place to explore and a lot of things going on. I mean, I can remember with uh, my dad uh, during haying season, he would have a hay baler and um, my job was just to sit on the, the box and it was the back where the twine came out 
and the twine periodically would break. So I would have to yell to them, you know, to stop because otherwise the hay bale would just be spewing out, you know, loose, loose hay and not uh, tied up. And one of the places that uh, he hayed, and I would ride the back of the hay baler, was um, at Stonehill. And oh. um, the field that is um, between 138 and uh, the football field uh -huh. uh, now, uh, that big field was, um, you know, hayed uh, very, you know, uh, for quite a number of years. My dad also, early on, um, what was the rose garden there, you know, um, tilled the soil and, and got it ready for the, um, you know, the Holy Cross Fathers to use as a cemetery, as it is now. Oh. Wonderful. So, so you were uh, really a farm kid, and baling hay. And uh, what else did you do on the farm? Well, the um, the farm was in existence until I was, um, oh, I'd say twelve. Um, so, I must say I wasn't probably that much of help. In fact, I got myself in trouble a few times by doing things I shouldn't do uh, on the farm. I remember one time with a friend we were pushing this. Uh, very large steel um, vat or bin, and in it was grain for the cows. And my friend and I were pushing it, and the wheel got caught in the um, uh, the trough behind the cows, and the darn thing just tipped over, and all this liquid, uh, like it was malt. Um, it was a byproduct for making beer, and it would be very good for the cows and their diet and make the the milk richer, but well, anyhow, on this particular day, this you know great big heavy iron um, container tipped over and spilled all over the barn. So that was one time I got in trouble. Another time was with friends running through the chicken coop, and all the little baby chicks were in there, and they um, a few of them expired because they didn't like the noise, and they had huddled and sort of smothered themselves. So I wasn't very helpful on a lot of occasions. You didn't step on them. No, didn't step on them, <laughs> um, but they. Uh, didn't like us running through and making a lot yeah. of noise, but um, there was a wonderful hayloft. Um, it was a great big barn, and um, a lot of haying was done. And it was, and we had a lot of uh, cats uh, in the barn. It was helped control rodents, and uh, around um, you know milking time, there would be a, a place where they would pour some uh, milk in that trough for the cats, and they would just come from who knows where, and they just would be dozens and dozens lined up to get their, their milk. And then up in the hayloft, you would um, be climbing around and having a great time. And all of a sudden, you come across a cat with some kittens um, way up in the hayloft. Oh, gee. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, so when you got to Northeastern in sixth grade, you were at the uh, original Olive Rames High School, the Yellow Building. That's right. It was uh, then the junior high. Right. And uh, so I did. Uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth, and I think even ninth grades there because the high school wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. uh, the addition hadn't been completed yet, so didn't get up to the high school until 10th grade. Mm -hmm. um, this is the end of Columbus Ave, right. which was the high school um, there. Mm -hmm. So um, who were some of your buddies, if you remember? Well, you know, the thing is... Um, and what did, what did you do together? <laughs> Well, the thing is, in Southeastern, again, um, the one who lived closest to me was Philip Watts, but he was like a half a mile away. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the other person I hung around with a good deal, and frankly, we'd have to have our parents drive us to either one person's house or the other, was Michael Del Colliano, uh, Dr. Del Colliano's son, and Doris's uh, son. And um, you know, I, I don't think we did anything really um, Oh, and another person lived in Southeastern, but um, again, not within walking distance with, was Kenneth DePaul. So, you know, I think frankly, um, they would just come over the farm and we'd bum around and, and um, explore and, you know, hike around the property and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, see the, the cattle. Uh, there was always a lot of cattle and um, we had about a, a hundred head. Um, they were uh, Holsteins, not mm -hmm. Guernseys, but Holsteins. Mm -hmm. So in, when you got to junior high, um, you must have be participated in extracurricular activities. Yeah, I did. Um, I was um, in the band. Um, Donald Amaralt was the band director. Oh, back I remember then. him well. Yeah, he was a, a great fellow. And then I always sort of enjoyed music. And so, you know, I, I guess um, I was in the glee club and I was in... What did you play? What instrument? Well, it's funny about that because... Growing up, 
at home, we had a uh, piano there, and I played the piano, and, um, and I was never all that great, but I uh, took lessons from Molly McNamara. So did I. Yeah, she taught oh. everybody. She did. I know. Did you pay 25 cents a lesson? I think it was up to 50. Was or it up maybe to even up to 75 at oh, that point. Oh, gee. And you remember the Canada Mints? Um, at least in my time, she always had a dish of Canada Mints, and when you were done with your lesson, you could take one either. Oh. And, for, and for many, many years, they were just the white ones, and then she diversified and got some the pink ones pink as well. Ones. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't remember those mints, but I remember walking from my house at the end of Seaver Street to the corner of Main and uh, Pond, where right. she and and you had and you entered the store that went uh, into the uh, piano. Yeah, room. the music room. Music you went room. in the side. Uh, you know, were up on it? the porch. Yeah. Went in there side door. Side door. Um, yeah. Although, when I think about it, I think it really was the main door because I can't think of a, a door right on Main Street there. But anyhow, you go in that door and immediately take a right. Take a right in, into in the, the music room. Right. And she had a grand piano, as I remember. Right. And also, we, we had to bring our little books, little booklets with us. And right. she would write in them uh, what our assignment was for the next time. Yeah. And she'd make a comment. And all of her ends looked like U's. Do you remember that <laughs> writing? And so I got really good at deciphering uh, different penmanships and things right. because of Molly McNamara. Yeah. I used to love her. She was wonderful, and yeah. she was very encouraging. Yeah. And But imagine, I paid. Well, Leon, this is a uh, disclosure. Leon is uh, seven years younger than I. He was a classmate of my baby brother, Freddie. Right. And Almquist. So um, it was a quarter then, and then it went up to 50 cents, 75 I it, cents. I think it may have even hit 75 cents, and yeah. it was for a half hour. Um, yeah. Because, you know, kids weren't going to sit no. patiently for a full hour. Um, but and she, she, was, she had so many students. I know, I know. Unbelievable. And that's right. She was very busy. And her... Um, Mendelssohn Society. She was the president yes, of uh, the, the Mendelssohn Society. Society. And they would have uh, recitals. Yes. And uh, I had to participate in those. Me too. Uh, yeah. But in <laughs> any event, so a piano isn't a very good instrument for a band. So it was suggested that I um, learn the uh, trombone. And that never really went all that well but I you know I did what I could and would be in the marching band and um, you know so anyhow that's but what, what about I did. the orchestra you, d you didn't you could play the piano in the orchestra yeah I, I I think you're absolutely right but I frankly can't remember well you know the thing is that one of my classmates at that time was Nancy King so if you oh. want to talk about someone who could play the piano right it would have been Nancy you know, and of course, uh, many of you don't know, but Nancy King was this daughter of Robert King, who taught me how to play the violin in third grade, and it was free. Yeah. It was and it was in the basement of the uh, grammar school on Main Street, yeah. and we were about six of us, eight years old, with with violins, little violins, and he would teach us. Uh, we didn't pay uh, any money for that. What he was doing was. Uh, building up and creating the orchestra um, so that when we reached junior high, we could be part of the junior high, senior high orchestra. Right. And then, of course, he was um, famous for his publication of music, right. um, brass music in particular. Oh. Um, and, um, oh, he was a wonderful guy. I know. And, of course, he had been in the Anna Ames band. So you, know, you talk about <gasps> he the... He was? Oh, sure. Oh, I didn't so realize he... you talk about the evolution oh. of... Uh, and so he was a... He grew up in Easton. Yes. I didn't realize that. Yeah, he had such a big heart. He was a wonderful man. Yeah, and he uh, was very generous to the Eastern Historical Society. Yeah, and you know, Nancy King married Michael Stone, and he was uh, uh, either a year a year behind me at Northeastern Law School or, hmm. or, or in my class, I can't remember. Hmm. But I said, I know your wife. <laughs> yeah, and wonderful family. Yes, yeah. oh, absolutely. So, so besides the band, um, did you get involved in sports? I... Uh, I played um, you know, some intramural stuff. I was n never really that you know, involved with athletics. I wasn't very good, and even today I'm still struggling around the golf course. But I did start um, you know, golf in um, probably when I was around 12 or 13 because you know, bringing you forward on you know, the um, life on the farm, uh, it continued until 1961. Um, as a dairy farm, but my, my father felt that it was very difficult to get reliable workers on the farm and 
people just didn't you know want to do that type of work and he was trying to do all of it and my mother was helping out in many ways and it really became quite burdensome and you know the economics of farming in New England uh, was becoming more problematic as well mm -hmm. so he decided that he was going to sell the property and um, thought about you know doing that he even thought about well he's going to sell the property and build a bo bowling alley or buy a bowling alley because bowling was very popular in mm -hmm. the late 50s early 60s he was in a bowling league but um, it really didn't turn out that way because um, my mother um, said to him well your brothers in Rhode Island who have a farm are presently building a golf course why don't we do that and he thought well um, the land is too flat uh, probably wouldn't make for a good golf course so he contacted a golf course architect by the name of Samuel Mitchell who lived in Canton and he had done work in the area and Mr. Mitchell said, no, you, you know, you can uh, do a lot with land. And if it's um, flat, you build hills in certain uh, locations for tees and greens. And so he decided to do it. So we put in a nine-hole course. The construction started in 1961. And again, I was um, 12 years old. It opened in 1962. Um, and so that's when I started to um, you know, become interested in, in play golf. I went over to Sharon. Um, to Sharon Country Club, Ed Kerouac was the longtime pro there, and I started to take lessons there. And, and so it's been a slow process from <laughs> 1962 to the present. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the seasons. Uh, in the wintertime, uh, did you go skating, and if so, yes. where, and, and who were your buddies? And well, the buddies remain the same. I mean, um, the thing is that it would be those, uh, you know, people right there um, within, you know, reasonable distance from um, my place and the, the farm. But, you know, there were ponds uh, there, um, particularly when the golf course came along, um, that there were some ponds that were good for skating. And there were, uh, my next door neighbor um, was Almira Chanel. Um, she was a Rankin. Um, she was the granddaughter of James Rankin, who had the uh, duck farm, and she had a good-sized hill on the side of uh, her barn, and we'd use that for sledding. Uh -huh. And so, you know, the usual snowball fights and um, building, you know, snow, um, snow, snowmen and skating and sledding and stuff like that. Um, you know, we um, didn't have a sleigh um, with the horses or anything of that nature, but, um, you yeah, know, did other things. Mm. And, then, and then, of course, in the summer, you would go swimming in those uh, ponds, right. yeah. lakes. Um, well, the thing is, you know, the funny thing, again, is that there's the swamp next to uh, our property, and you, you don't really go swimming in the Hockamock Swamp, but uh, when the golf course um, was developed, one of the sort of trivia questions is how many of the ponds that are located along Eastern Country Club are natural? And the answer is none. Uh, none of them existed until the course was developed in 1961. Oh. And it started as a nine-hole course. Uh, I was talking about the construction back then, but it existed for nine holes until the late 60s. And at that point, um, the Diocese of Fall River purchased the property next to us to build Holy Cross Church. And um, the church retained the front land along Purchase Street, but we were able to buy the rear land. Um, my father, at that point, had, had died, and my older brother, who was a lawyer living in Illinois at that time, uh, was instrumental in uh, acquiring that land, and that's where the second nine holes came oh, in. Okay. And uh, then it's been an 18-hole golf course um, ever since. Mm -hmm. So um, you also went to law school. I did. And uh, what, what impact did growing up in Easton have on that decision, if at all? You know, I think it was really the fact that my brother um, had preceded me uh, down that uh, road of being a lawyer. And um, <laughs> I know when I was in college um, and I went to Tufts, um, uh, you know, of course, you get to the end of your college years and you're trying to figure out what are, what are you going to do. And that's, of course, um, the question that my mother posed to me, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I didn't have a good answer for her. And so she said, well, why don't you go to law school like your brother did? And because I didn't have a good alternative <laughs> at that time, <laughs> I guess I, 
I did that and I see. went to law school and ended up um, going to the same law school he did, which was Boston University. He mm -hmm. went to BU undergrad um, as well as the law school. He uh, graduated from Oliver Ames in 1949, so he moved to Easton with my parents in 45, and so he had all four years of high school here in Easton and then finished in 40. Uh, so 49. he was 18 years uh, older than you. Correct. So you you're, were you were surprised. I guess that's right. You know, <laughs> uh, your math is very good, Priscilla, to figure all <laughs> that you. out quickly. Well, uh, so you became uh, a lawyer um, with a lot of high values, I mean, good standards, uh, because Easton at that time, and even today, I think, mm -hmm. ha values uh, ethics and, and uh, uh, people are generally uh, concerned about in one's integrity and so mm -hmm. forth. Oh, yeah, the, um, you know, you, there were some basic fundamental values and principles that you, you got living in the town. There was a sense of independence here. Um, you, you know, you sort of um, learned, you know, you learned how to, you know, be a good student, good citizen, um, and you, you didn't have um, a lot of, uh, well, you know, it was very traditional, let's put it that way. I mean, so I'm sure the families were very uh, good about making sure they nurtured their children in traditional ways, but not in an overbearing way. Um, you learned how to get along with other people. Um, you learned how to respect uh, one another and um, just uh, have a good, productive society. Right, and I think respect. Uh, you hit the, the, you know, the the major uh, value that we that we grew up with, that mm -hmm. no matter what somebody believed uh, or disagreed with you, you still respected that person, mm -hmm. and there was civility in your relationships. That's right. And I can remember um, that I was told that if I got in trouble at school. Um, I would really uh, pay for it, mm -hmm. and uh, that the teacher was always right, and all of that. Uh, and as you know, my dad was chairman of the Board of Selectmen and Board of Welfare, which existed at that time prior to social services. And so he was also, I guess, the police commissioner. Hmm. And we had, the, um, we had that one-room jail, what was it called? The lockup. Yes. <laughs> and um. he said to me, if you, if you ever so much as get a ticket, you know, you're going to pay twice as much. Uh, if you ever get in trouble, I, I'm not bailing you out. You're going to stay overnight in that. I mean, I was so scared. Yeah. You know? Well, but of course, it shows that, um, you know, society didn't have too many uh, bad actors in those days because look how small the lockup was. Yes. I mean, you couldn't have put too many people in there well, at the same time. There were only 7,000 people in town, and we knew all of them. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, I might have, I wasn't really scared because I had such high respect for my parents and so did you. And we wanted to honor them by the, our own behavior, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you didn't, you know, you just expected that you should, um, you know, that you expected that they were going to be, you know, fair and, and but they were going to be a discipline, you know, disciplinarians right. um, to, um, keep you in line, and you knew they should, shouldn't stray too far from that uh, straight and narrow line. And yeah. so the thing was that you did grow up with very traditional values, which I think has been to all of our benefit. Yes, absolutely. The um, you know and other things that were traditional in Easton. I, growing up where I did, and not having a lot of other kids in the neighborhood, uh, the ladies next door, and I say ladies because Elmira Chanel. Um, when her husband died, her sisters moved in, two of the Rankin sisters. First was Harriet, um, who had lived at the big house of the center opposite the monument, which is now in pretty tough shape. Mm. But that was an old Reed and Rankin home. Oh. So Harriet <coughs> moved in, and then later her sister Virginia uh, did as well. But when I was uh, younger, and when it was Elmira and her husband, um, they would take me to the church um, suppers um, and the strawberry festivals up at the Evangelical Congregational Church. And what, was, what could be more quintessential New England is yes. those old uh, church suppers. Right. And they were, frankly, a, a lot of fun. And I grew up, um, you know, across that driveway from um, the Rankin uh, sisters and got to be very, you know, friendly and close with them. 
And through Virginia, who was a history teacher, I think really got an appreciation for history in general, American history, and then American history sort of leads you down the path of um, government, law, and so I, I credit them for almost planting the seeds that um, you know, ultimately turned out that I did what I did. Right. Well, you know, I think that's true of most of us. Um, our parents are the major influence, of course, but then there are the people outside that circle, uh, whether it's f from the church or other social groups that have, can have a, a tremendous impact. Mm -hmm. um, and our eyes are open, mm -hmm. uh, and we were brought up to be open-minded. Yeah. And then ultimately, as fate would have it, I ended up buying the house um, that um, they lived in, uh, and that's where Oh, it's um, a beautiful Sarah house. Sarah and I reside now. Yes, and you have, um, it's just beautiful, and I love the, the, the choice of colors. Thanks. It's just a beautiful home, yeah. So um, what would you say to people out there who um, are just recently moved to Easton? What, what are some hmm. of the, the things that, uh, ha that you grew up with that are still remaining here in the community? Well, I think that, frankly, Easton is getting better and better as time goes on. I, I really would say for new um, residents that they're lucky uh, to be able to appreciate um, the history, the, um, the resources, the assets that we have in Easton that are, frankly, getting um, better and more polished and improved over, over time. Uh, some areas need work. Um, these old buildings need attention and all, but and when you look at the shovel shop project for uh, an example, uh, that could have been a disastrous outcome for um, that site. It was on the list of the most in, one of the most endangered historic sites in the country at one time. The National Trust for Historic Preservation right. um, was certainly concerned about it. And that's great. The library, the Cuisic Gardens behind it, um, the Governor Ames estate now um, managed by the trustees of reservations. I mean, that's a feather in our cap to have a facility that's um, managed by the trustees uh, when you think of what their properties are around the state, and we're one of them now. Right. Uh, so I think that's great, um, and certainly borderland is uh, very important. Naturally, a lot of this, um, you know, is the good fortune that we have that the Ameses uh, were so civic-minded and left so, uh, such a legacy here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, my grandfather got off the boat from Sweden and uh, worked at the Shovel Works. So for me, it was very personal. Mm -hmm. And um, David Ames uh, started the Friends of the Ames Shovel Works. And I was very active in that, as I'm sure you were, and a lot, a lot of us uh, here in Easton who grew up here. And we literally saved that. Yeah. And um, I'm so proud of it. And it's uh, the Beacon Communities has done a wonderful job in mm -hmm. keeping the uh, uh, exterior uh, exactly the way it was. Mm -hmm. Beautiful granite, gorgeous. And the property is, is beautifully landscaped. And um, the public can go through there. I mean, there's not, it's not a closed place. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now the downtown of Main Street is getting revitalized. It is. It's a slow process, but we're <laughs> it's moving forward in the right yeah. direction. Um, and so I think that's all uh, really wonderful. So I think it's a uh, great community and a lot to be proud of. And I would urge people to um, explore and be involved with the Eastern Historical Society. I'm on the board. You've been a loyal contributor to the society. And it's a great uh, resource to find out more about the, the town uh, because we do have a pretty diverse uh, history, not just the manufacturing of, of the Ameses, but um, you have you know, the farming uh, stories um, and um, other uh, people of um, you know, note yeah. who have come through uh, Easton. Um, and every, um, every month is an open house. Um, and so um, I think the second not, Sunday. Second of the Sunday. Month. I was going to say I wanted to make sure I was right on yes. that. The second Sunday. And so, the, you know, it's a great way to just get to meet other people and also learn uh, about whatever the exhibit is mm -hmm. that particular month. Mm -hmm. So it's the second Sunday of the month, 1 to 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, there's always a, an exhibit of some kind to stimulate uh, one's curiosity and to learn something about, mm -hmm. about Easton. Also, I think um, Chafin's book. Now, Reverend Chafin was the, the reverend of the Unitarian Church, 
and he <laughs> wrote a book in 1886 about the, called The History of Easton. And, uh, you know, and then there was a sequel written uh, from 1886 to... About well, 1974 or 5. 75, right, in commemoration of the uh, uh, 275th anniversary. Right. And now in um, uh, 2025, is it, we're going to have the 300 years? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Right. And so, you know, you can, those of you out there, you can contribute to that by sending a check to Jeremy Gillis, a uh, town clerk, uh, and put in the memo that it's for the uh, 2025 300th anniversary of the town celebration. Um, so in, you're very active in the Historical Society and um, uh, it's wonderful to see that you know, you, you, you've come back to town, uh, you, you went on to become a judge in the land court and you've had a very interesting and exciting life and you've contributed so much to um, life in general, not just here in Easton, but throughout the Commonwealth. Well, thank you. Um, in fact, coming up at the next open house, um, turning the page back on one of my other activities, uh, I had served as state representative for Easton uh, for s three terms, uh, six years. Yes, so, I rem now I remember so that. So yes. I'm putting together, as far as the open house in June, at the Historical Society, a panel discussion with uh, Representative Cheryl Cronin, our current uh, Claire Cohen. Cl I'm sorry, Claire. I know a Cheryl Cohen, oh, Co yeah. um, Cronin as well. But uh, Claire, Claire Cronin, Cronin uh -huh. is going to be on, as well as um, myself and John Ames. So the three of us are the um, last three um, representatives um, from the town of Easton. Of course, Easton has had representatives in between. Uh, I left in '82 and um, there have been a series of representatives, but they didn't live in Easton, although mm -hmm. they represent the town. So um, Claire and Cronin is now our uh, current, but first representative in about 30 years since I left. Wow, now tell me something. Um, you're going to, you did a lot of research for this program, and it's really based on people from Easton who have been involved in legislatures around the country. Well, it's um, a list of those who have held state office or national office, um, and they either held those offices while they were uh, living in Easton, and then I have another list for those people who held state and national office either before they came to Easton or after they left Easton. And oh, um, okay. there's some uh, interesting um, points, and I'll sort of save it for those to Absolutely. go to the Historical Society meeting. I think ECAT's going to be filming it anyhow. Yeah. But you'll learn about you know some, uh, it's almost like a trivia question, like who's the um, person who lived in Easton, who originally came from Easton, who became governor of Massachusetts, other than Oliver Ames. <laughs> and there is another person. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's the Easton connection. Right. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Um, any other comments you want to make about growing up in Easton and, and the impact it had on your life and, uh, and so forth? Uh, it's a continuing saga for you. It is. Um, I, th I think it's, you know, again, a, a wonderful community. And we each have our own you know, sort of uh, remembrances and experiences. Um, and they're different. It depends on which part of town you grew up in, who your friends were, what the neighborhood uh, was like. Um, you know, those people who lived right in the village, um, you know, had a lot of um, interaction with uh, other kids and, and, you know, sports became more of an activity for them. Um, and that's one reason why living in Southeastern, I maybe didn't uh, develop that skill set. But, um, but we all came together and we all have a great appreciation uh, for this town. And as I said, I think it's getting better and better all the time and um, it's great to see. Well, one last question. Um, Given the fact that you were an attorney, uh, you could have gone anywhere. Why is it that you chose to stay in Easton? Well, the roots were very deep. I mean, I, um, you know, once I finished law school, I got my very first um, job working for a person in Foxborough. And so I lived at home. It was an easy commute. Um, and it wasn't very long after I um, started practicing. That was in Passed in seventy, passed the bar in seventy four. Really started working in seventy five, and then all of a sudden, 
I became aware that Representative John Ames III was not going to be running for re-election in 1976, and it was suggested by some people that I should run. So um, all of a sudden, here I am, um, only a year, year and a half out of law school, and I'm a candidate for the state uh, legislature. You weren't even 30 years old. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. And so I then um, represented, when I was elected, um, I represented Easton, Norton, and one precinct of um, the town of Mansfield. So I stayed here, obviously, um, as the local representative, and it was always natural to stay. I mean, I got involved with um, Brockton Hospital on the Board of Trustees and um, other you know, civic activities in the area. I was involved with the NRT and other things. So it was always just natural to be very, very close to the old side. Well, we want to thank you so much for your contributions to Easton and to the wider world, but especially to Easton. Uh, and the fact that you stayed around and, uh, and you're still committing yourself to all kinds of wonderful endeavors. So I want to thank you, Leon, for being my guest today. Thank you. And um, for those of you out there, I hope you have enjoyed this program as much as Leon and I have. And until next time, be well, take care. <laughs>